Good afternoon and welcome to Falling Walls Lab Australia 2020. I'm Anna Maria Arabia, Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land on which the Academy office is located. 
The Academy also acknowledges and pays respect to the Elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which the Academy operates and its fellows live and work. They hold the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. The first Falling Walls Lab in the world took place in Berlin in 2011. Since then, international labs have taken place in different cities around the world throughout the year. So far, Falling Wall Labs have taken place in more than 55 countries. The Falling Walls Lab finale is held each year on the day the Berlin Wall came down and gathers 100 participants, amongst them all winners of the international labs. This year will be slightly different. In place of the traditional lab finale, winners of the local Falling Walls Lab will have their pitch video shared. From these videos, a panel of international judges will select 10 finalists who will take part in the digital live event on the 4th of November 2020. One presenter will then be awarded the Breakthrough Winner of the Year title on stage at Falling Walls Day on the 9th of November in front of an audience of industry leaders, decision makers, investors and international media representatives. These labs support interdisciplinary dialogue and international cooperation. They connect aspiring innovators and senior researchers and they develop new and sustainable ways of scientific communication. That is why the Australian Academy of Science is delighted to be a partner with the Falling Walls Foundation in organising the fourth Falling Walls Lab in Australia. On behalf of the Academy, I would also like to acknowledge the following partners for their generous support. The Falling Walls Lab Foundation, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Canberra, and your access, researchers in motion. I would like to acknowledge and thank Professor Hans Buckel, fellow of this Academy, and Dr. Judith Reinhardt, Head of Science and Innovation at the German Embassy in Canberra. They have both been the driving force of the labs in Australia for many years. Hans will also be today's Master of Ceremonies. We look forward to hearing from the 10 young researchers and innovators from all disciplines who were selected to present their work their business model, innovative projects, social initiatives or ideas. We wish them all the very best of luck. Over to you, Hans. Thank you, Anna Maria, and good afternoon. I'm Professor Hans Bachor, Secretary for Education and Public Awareness from the Academy of Sciences in Australia, and I will be our MC for this afternoon. As Anna Maria mentioned, this year the lab is slightly different from those organized in previous years. As we all know, many events and meetings have been to move online and due to the global pandemic. So thank you for joining in and let this be a nice and challenging event. Dick, it's exciting to be here as your MC for Falling Walls. And to see all these researchers ready to share their memorable work for each presenter has just three minutes to make their case to explain the wall they want to break down. We're most grateful to the panel and renowned judges who will select the winners of today's competition. And the jury members are. And to see all these leaders, Professor John Schein, jury chair and the president of the Australian Academy of Sciences. Ms. Bebelby Blassi, Head of Technical Global R&D Operations at 3M, Australia. Mrs. Kate Hart, Vice President of AT Kearney Management Consulting. Ms. Rosie Hicks, CEO of Australian Research Data Commons. Ms. Sue McLemon, Chair of MedTech and Pharma Growth Center. Professor Michael Schutz, Director of Jamison Trauma Institute, Metro North Hospital and Health. And Dr. Jack Steele, Director of Science Impact and Policy, CSO. Thank you for joining us. Falling Walls Labs brings together young scientists, engineers, professionals from across the globe to present their vision on how to make an even better place. I would now like to invite and introduce the presenters. Breaking the wall of misconception about pain, Joshua Pate from the University of Technology, Sydney. 
Breaking the Wall of Recycling CO2 in Mining, Jessica Hamilton from Ansto. Breaking the Wall of Genetics for Doctors, Alan Robertson from Clear Sky Genomics. Breaking the Wall of Confused Composition, Jay Leibovich from the University of Queensland's Critical Thinking Project. Breaking the Wall of the Ineffective Cancer Treatments, Andrew Law from the Garvin Institute for Medical Research. Breaking the Wall of Artificial Intelligence in Mental Health, Sally Richmond from the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health at Monash University. Breaking the Wall of Age Care Monitoring, Dashen Dong from RMIT University. Breaking the Wall of Atomic Hydrogen Imaging, Ethan Son Chen from the University of Sydney. Breaking the Wall of Movement Disorders, Pamela Bernoud from Deakin University. Breaking the Wall of Broken Wounds, Eamon McKenna from the Queensland University of Technology. We look forward to hearing from our presenters shortly, but now to officially open the event, I would like to invite His Excellency, Dr. Thomas Fitchen, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Australia, to say a few words. Dear Falling Walls presenters and guests, distinguished jury members, the Falling Walls Lab was held for the first time in Australia in 2016. And since then, it has really become a household name in the Australian science and innovation community. The German Embassy is very grateful to have such an outstanding partner in the Australian Academy for, of Science for the Falling Walls Lab. I would like to thank both the Academy for organizing today's event and of course the eminent members of the jury for giving their time, especially under such challenging circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, Falling Walls is all about connecting people. It's about connecting scientists with business leaders, connecting industry with innovators, and also internationally connecting Australian talent with the German innovation scene. But this year, everything is different due to the pandemic. Personal meetings, networking, and connecting face-to-face -face are no longer possible, at least for a while. And by the way, that's the same for diplomacy. I suffer the same way uh, that you do. So Falling Walls Lab, around the world are being held as virtual events, including here in Australia. We are still finding our feet in this strange new world of Zoom meetings, webinars, digital conferences, and virtual visits. But we also realize that international cooperation is more important than ever in these taxing times. The COVID pandemic has reminded us that no nation exists in isolation, that our societies are knit together very closely, and as a result, we depend on each other. Only together can we overcome the global challenges of our times. These days, the motto of our competition, Falling Walls, a reminder, of course, of events in Germany exactly 30 years ago, is even more significant. Research science and technology have emerged as a beacon of hope for suffering societies all around the world. They play a crucial role in managing the current crisis, in finding solutions, and in showing us a way forward. Researchers, industry, political leaders, and funding agencies worldwide have joined forces in an unprecedented way and dimension. Such a coordinated pursuit of a common goal gives us hope that together we will beat the pandemic. Many researchers from Germany and Australia are part of this global effort, building on the long and successful tradition in cooperation in science and research between our two countries. Falling walls, everyone's competition and contribution today helps in this global effort by identifying breakthrough science and by supporting innovative ideas that can change the world by building new scientific connections and by fostering international research activities. So I would like to congratulate all young participants for being part of this very special Falling Walls Lab 2020. And I look forward to hearing about your breakthrough ideas and innovation in the course of today. I strongly believe in the human mind and its capacity to innovate. I therefore trust that scientific innovation will also help us to solve this crisis and will also allow us to meet again and hopefully in person next year for Falling Walls Australia 2021. Thank you very much and all the best. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador Fitchen, for your kind words. Now let's proceed and start the presentations. Each presenter will have three minutes to pitch their project, followed by two minutes for questions and comments from the jury to the presenter. Our first and second third place winners will be decided by the jury and announced at the event today later. They will join the global event in Berlin in November. There will also be a People's Choice winner today. And our live stream audience, it's encouraged that you vote for this winner. Following all 10 presentations, the voting will be open. The link to vote will be the comments section of your live stream on YouTube and on Facebook. Also, we encourage you to engage today with Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Our Twitter hashtag for today is hashtag FallingWalls20 and you can tag at falling underscore walls and at science underscore academy. Now, please welcome our first presenter, Joshua Pate from the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm excited about pain. Well, let me clarify. I'm excited about the science of pain. Firstly, because it's complex. In 1995, the British Medical Journal published a paper about a 29-year-old builder who had who, a big fall and he landed on a nail. The nail was 15 centimetres long and it went right through his steel cap boot. He was in such agonising pain, he got rushed straight in an ambulance to hospital, gave him lots of medications. But what they discovered was when they took off the boot, the nail had actually gone up between his toes. Pain is really, really complex. And for one in five Australians, this is true. They have pain lasting longer than you would expect the tissues in their body to heal. Secondly, pain is costly. Last year alone, it cost Australia more than $50 billion. So the, the numbers worldwide are just staggering. And thirdly, it can be confusing. The guidelines suggest that we should teach people about pain, but with pain textbooks having more than 500 pages, it's hard to know where to start. My research in my PhD focused on developing the concept of pain inventory. We aim to address gaps and misconceptions by developing an assessment tool. We went to international experts and patients and patient advocates to develop this tool in a rigorous way. And now it's possible to target learning and evaluate the effectiveness of education. So firstly, if someone has a misunderstanding or, or they just don't know something about pain science that is important to know, then we can use this tool to identify that and develop algorithms to target that education. And secondly, we can see whether or not someone has changed their understanding conceptual change has occurred and then we can correlate that and see if that's causing behavior changes and better outcomes for those people. So we're on the cusp of what I think is a conceptual revolution and that phrase uh, like if you think of Isaac Newton years and years ago when he first discovered gravity and we started to understand how the planets work or or even in the 1980s with the slip slop slap campaign people back then weren't wearing t-shirts or sunscreen to protect themselves from the sun but now it's the norm. And in the last 20 years, pain science has undergone this revolution, but it hasn't been accessible yet to these generations. So we've, we've been developing resources to try and target schools and changing curriculums and, and building this tool to try and address these issues, because I think a conceptual revolution is really at hand. So I dare you to start learning about the science of pain. It might just be the start of a revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. We now have two minutes for questions. Please welcome jury member Balbi Blessy to ask Joshua a question. Hi, Joshua. Um, um, excellent idea. Um, my question is, pain management process has been around for hundreds of years and it's very complex. How is your idea different when dealing with factors such as emotions, acute and chronic pain? Thank you. Great question. Thanks. Um, so I think it's it's important to differentiate pain management strategies from pain science education. And, and I think 
you're, you're absolutely right in saying that we've, we've been trying to manage pain in various ways for quite a long time, like millennia. Um, but the, the scientific underpinning that, that gives people the confidence to, to trust these management strategies or trust new management strategies that are being developed is underpinned by, by this, um, these recent scientific breakthroughs. And so by simplifying those concepts and, and teaching the whole um, next generation or the current generation, um, we're seeing improved pain outcomes. And, and so I, like my understanding is that if we do this on a global scale, then we'll, we'll have a totally different understanding um, with the generation to come. It will, it will just become um, the norm to, to understand this complexity better. Thank you. Um, now I would like to invite Sue McLemon to ask the brief question and a quick answer, please. Thanks, Joshua. What is the unique value proposition when you consider the broader competitive landscape? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. There's a few different teams around the world developing different resources. And um, I think rather than it being a, a competition, it's um, people collaborating and working together on this, um, which is a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, things like building online animations and, and board games and children's books and just different resources that people can access. And I, I suppose there is some sense of competition there, um, but it's also been really exciting to be a part of different collaborative efforts from around the world. Thank you, Joshua, Fabia and Sue. Now let's start the second uh, presenter, Jessica Hamilton from Ensto. The mining industry touches all of our lives by providing the raw materials for the buildings we're in, the products we buy, and the technology that we need to transition to a low carbon future. But mining also has a waste problem. Mineral waste are just stockpiled in massive heaps. Waste acid is an environmental risk that costs millions to manage, and the industry is a big CO2 emitter. Now, often we find ourselves pitching environmental values and economic values against each other. But this conversation is not going to be, be about either team environment or team economy. It's going to be about harmonizing both together. That starts with a question. What if we start thinking about all these wastes as resources? By combining them, we can create valuable products and offset CO2 emissions. In my PhD, I demonstrated a low cost process to put this idea into practice and to break the wall of recycling CO2 in mining. So how does this work? First, we target mines that have rocks rich in magnesium and calcium. If we irrigate their mineral wastes with acid, the minerals dissolve and we get water rich in magnesium and calcium. When that reacts with CO2, it forms carbonate minerals. Carbonates are environmentally safe and they're used in industries from construction to pharmaceuticals. My research also showed that during the acid leaching process, valuable trace metals in the mineral waste accumulate in a concentrated layer. So by reusing all these wastes, we neutralize the acid, capture CO2 in valuable carbonates, and transform stockpiles of mineral waste into an enriched ore that can be remined. You might be thinking, why has no one done this before? Well, previous research has focused on maximizing conversion efficiency, and it's relied on engineered reactors with high temperatures, pressures, and chemicals. So far, no economically viable process has been developed. In my work, rather than striving for 100% conversion, I instead looked for really low energy and low cost technologies that could be repurposed for this and implemented immediately. I scaled up experiments from the lab to the first ever field trials. And the outcomes of this work are now contributing to a testing program for diamond mines in Africa and Canada that aims to achieve the first carbon neutral mine. So by changing the way we think, and seeing CO2 not just as a problem, but as a solution, we can transform the waste process and squeeze out as much economic and environmental value as we can while feeding into growing markets for low carbon raw materials. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Please welcome jury member Kate Hart to ask a question. Hello, thanks Jessica, great presentation. My question relates to IP, just wanting to understand what IP surrounds the product and its delivery, please. Uh, sorry, I did quite, do you mind if I turn off my video uh, to hear that a little better? Sure. 
All right. Just yeah. The question is, um, what IP relates to the product and its delivery, please? Um, this is this technology is something that will be implemented um, in a tailored way um, at each mine that would be considered. So it's not a technology that could be um, patented up and rolled out across the board. It's something that is um, really, it's not a one shoe fits all approach. And so it depends very much on site-based factors like the availability of waste um, and the particular mineralogy and geochemistry there. So um, this is something that we're working on collaboratively all around the world. Um, it's not something we're looking at uh, restricting um, in terms of patents or IP. It's something that we want to work with our mining companies in a collaborative way uh, to see this approach implemented in different ways at different mines. Thank you, Jessica and Kate. And apologies for the slight technical uh, difficulties we have, but I hope you heard the question and the answer. So now let's welcome the third presenter, Alan Robertson from Clear Sky genomics. In Australia, the government is investing hundreds of millions of dollars into the rollout of clinical genomics. This is fantastic news because by studying the information in the DNA, we can produce better diagnoses, better treatments, and a better understanding of things like cancer. Now, this support for clinical genomics has the potential to cement our position as a global leader in the space, but more importantly, it has the potential to transform healthcare for millions of Australians. In fact, some estimates say that clinical genomics can help more than 10 million people in this country. The thing is that there is so much data in your DNA and there are so many differences that make each one of us unique that it's almost impossible for your doctor to make sense of all this information. In fact, there are less than 500 specialists that can do this. That's 500 specialists for 10 million people. If we want to realize the potential of clinical genomics, if we want the people we care about to receive the best standard of care, then we need to help more doctors use genetic information. We need something like an MRI or a CT scan, something that doctors can hold up to the light and see what the issue is. We need an X-ray of the DNA. And that's what led me to leave my job as a researcher and found a startup. I took advantage of all the support, the innovation. I found like-minded people who believed in our vision and we found investment. And together we started building this X-ray for DNA. Over the last 18 months, we've built a tool that helps clinicians understand a patient's DNA at the whole genome level, the chromosome level, the cytoband level, and at the level of the individual genes. It gives clinicians the same information, it supports the same tests, it just presents this information in a way that's more accessible. Now, this really shouldn't be a novel or innovative idea, but from our conversations, it seems to be revolutionary. Our work isn't just languishing in a paper hoping that someone's going to discover it. It's out there leading to new innovations now. We completed our first clinical pilot earlier this year and we're finalizing a partnership with an American organization that wants to bring our solution to the reproductive health sector. We want to use that opportunity as a foothold to, and expand outward to bring our tool to as many different areas of, as, of health as we can. So if we want to realize the potential of clinical genomics, then we need to break down the wall of genetic complexity, and we need to help more doctors understand the information in their patient's DNA. My name is Alan Robertson. I'm the founder of Clear Sky Genomics, and we're developing the X-ray for your DNA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. We now welcome jury chair, Professor John Shine, to ask Ellen a question. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Ellen. That's, uh, that's certainly a challenge for today's general practitioners to get through that complexity. Oh, but thank you question, very much. Yeah, my question really, though, is how difficult will it be in, in practice, do you think, to uh, for your proposed X-ray to be fairly easily integrated into a standard pathology report? Hmm. Uh, that's a really good question. And before I uh, go down that route, I need to thank you for not asking if it's possible for me to speak without twirling my uh, presenter remote. Um, but 
we're really connected um, to the digital health space. And one of the pillars of modern digital health is interoperability. So what we've been doing is making sure that our platform is able to take the results from a standard report, be it from a uh, report in, I guess, non-invasive prenatal testing or a report in, I guess, a uh, genetic disease test and pull all that information together and give a specialist to begin with the skills to make sense of that information. Uh, once that product is mature, then we'll start taking the learnings that we've uh, had there to help GPs and regular clinicians uh, begin to tackle some of the simpler tests. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome Professor Michael Schutz to ask Ellen a question. Yeah, Ellen, many thanks. A great idea. Oh, thank this you. Might, this might be a very complex process of understanding the various genetic aspects in relation to a high range of diseases. How would you tackle this? And which main partners do you need to realize your concept? All right, that's uh, the, I guess, the real elephant in the uh, room with this. And that's why we're starting very, very small with specific tests. Um, so that's why we're working with Americans to support expanded non-invasive prenatal testing. But once we've uh, done that, we plan on uh, expanding the tool out to help genetic counselors and clinical geneticists. We're not aiming to uh, replace them in that early version of the tool. We want to support them. We want to offer clinical decision support. So they're able to more efficiently dig into the data and uh, make sense of that information. So, um, of course, to make sure that they can do that, we are supporting you know, the ACMG AMP guidelines for variant curation um, in future releases, but it's still a uh, problem that we're trying to tackle you know, one step at a time. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, John and Michael. Please welcome our fourth presenter, Yeo Leibovich, from the University of Queensland Critical Thinking Project. Close your eyes and think back to your schooling days. Do you remember sitting there silently listening to your teacher ramble on? Trust me, you were not alone. Ironically, talking is actually one of the most powerful ways to learn. According to the research, when students are given the opportunity to dialogue in class, their understanding and reasoning skills soar. But for some reason, the value of talk has been forgotten when it comes to how we teach writing in high school. Don't blame teachers though. Talk more to write better? It's seemingly counterintuitive. The thing is though, no matter who you are, writing well is difficult to do. For example, according to NAPLAN data, as students progress through school, an increasing percentage fail to meet the minimum literacy standards. This worrying trend is compounded by the decreasing percentage of high achieving student writers. Globally, the data is equally concerning. Given that literacy is a crucial part of our daily life, how we teach writing is a need of a new approach. And my project offers just that. I have designed an innovative professional development program that is transforming classroom practices. Contrast the conventional teacher dictated approach my program is built around the key roles that student conversation and critical thinking play in writing. Here I bring to bear the game-changing power of collaborative reasoning on literacy learning. By collaborative reasoning, I mean the shared use of student talk to critically analyze and logically evaluate their claims and decisions when writing, a teaching method which no other writing model has meaningfully considered. For example, instead of telling students how to structure a writing task, Ask them how they would approach it. Then, as a class, weigh the merits of their suggestions, a collaborative planning process that both supports and challenges student writers. Thus far, my findings show marked improvement, not only in students' written communication, but in their critical thinking and teamwork as well, a useful skill set for the 21st century. Now, four out of five participating students write with both confidence and understanding. In addition, 100% of participating teachers from different subjects can now more easily identify and respond to their pupils' individual needs due to the dramatic increase in student engagement. These findings indicate that my approach is not only viable, but is also highly transferable. And if applied more generally, 
has the potential to correct the downward trend in secondary school writing while simultaneously preparing students to communicate more effectively in the real world. My next step is to expand this program to educational institutions across Australia and beyond. And then together, we can break the wall of confused composition. Thank you. Thank you, Yale. We welcome jury member Rosie Hicks to ask Jail a question, please. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Yale. The importance of writing well, of course, cannot be overstated. Uh, but my question for you is, what's the extent of the pilot scheme at the moment? And you've spoken about growing across Australia and globally. How will you do that? Thanks, great question. So um, my formal findings are based on a qualitative study in one state school, but I've run professional development programs for teachers and administrators and literacy coaches from across the state in Queensland, and also recently via like digital technology from other states in Australia. So in terms of how I can build upon this, I'm really lucky in that I work uh, with the UQ's Critical Thinking Project, and they're trying to grow their platform, and they already work collaboratively with Canada and the US, as well as some other countries, and uh, domestically across Australia. So it's about kind of leveraging those connections to make it widely available to educators, both in Australia and across the world. And I feel like there's definitely a pathway available to me. It's just a matter of kind of taking it to that next step. Thank you. Thank you. And let me welcome jury member Kate Hart to ask Jail a question. Hello, thank you. Yes, great presentation. Uh, my question relates to the transferability. So how, um, obviously there's a significant increase in student engagement. How transferable is this to other topics? For instance, um, mathematics. Do you mean like writing in mathematics or math mathematics as a subject more broadly? Mathematics as a subject more broadly, but also interested in the former. Sure. Um, yeah, so actually there's a fair bit of research out already around how the power of using collaborative reasoning or dialogic teaching is really effective in science classrooms and mathematics classroom and English classrooms. My formal research was actually situated in humanities classrooms. Um, but so I would say there's already uh, proof of evidence that collaborative reasoning is an effective strategy in general in a space like mathematics. But I would also say in the context of my program, it's all about academic writing, which is what you need to do across all disciplines, right? So you have to justify how you arrived at that answer, how you came to that conclusion. So definitely by giving mathematics students the opportunity to actually talk through that thinking process, that would then translate very effectively into their written justifications for how they've arrived at their problem solving with their maths. Um, Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Yale, Rosie and Kate. Now, please welcome our fifth presenter, Andrew Law from the Garvin Institute of Medical Research. Cancer can change our world in an instant. It can indiscriminately affect any one of us. Just last year alone, 50,000 Australians died from cancer. So getting healthcare that's right for you is crucial because it can mean the difference between life or death. But there is a major problem in knowing if a cancer treatment will work for a patient or not. Imagine if you got diagnosed with cancer and your first line of treatment failed. What happens then? Well, your chance of surviving cancer drops and you will keep moving to the next best option until hopefully they find the right one. But this trial and error method of testing treatments in your body is not only traumatizing to you, but it's expensive for healthcare and patients. But what if there was a device that can let you know which treatment is right for your cancer? So to improve the survival chance of patients, I developed the Alton Medical Device, which uses a specialized gel that closely resembles the environment of the human body. And we can trick tumors into surviving within it. We can take the patient biopsy, preserve it within the medical gel, and test multiple treatments on that tumor biopsy. We can then evaluate the tumor's response to the therapies and identify resistances and vulnerabilities based on data acquired from genetic sequencing and histopathology, which are standard tests used in hospitals. The information is then relayed to help guide doctors to identify the best treatment option for the patient. Alton provides free, crucial information for both the doctors and the patient. 
That is one, predict if the patient will benefit from chemotherapy. Two, identify the most effective treatment. And three, personalize the therapeutic strategy for the patient. Clinical studies have shown that by personalizing cancer treatments, the success of these therapies can improve by more than six times compared to the conventional one-size-fits-all strategy. As such, Alton was developed to break down the wall of ineffective cancer treatments by finding the best therapeutic option that is unique to each patient. Alton has been scientifically validated using both preclinical models and clinical samples and will file for a patent application with the Garvin Medical Institute. And in an exciting collaboration with the King Hong Cancer Center, we've enrolled 30 gastric cancer patients into an early stage trial starting later this year. We aim to incorporate Alton seamlessly into a personalized medicine workflow within hospitals. And finally, with the University of Technology Sydney, we've developed a user-friendly design of our device that fits within the palm of your hands. So getting cancer may be out of our control, but finding the right treatment doesn't have to be. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We now welcome Sue McLemon to ask Andrew a question. Thank you, Andrew. Great presentation. What are the competing technologies that provide a similar output that are already validated and in use? Yeah, thanks for the question. So you're right. We do have competitors in the field, for example, in vitro QGEL, and um, the other one would be MatTech. However, the other, our competitors have one thing that are missing in their models, which are the complexity of the tumor. So they, what other companies do is that they take a tumor, but they only get the cancer cells from that and that use that to preserve it. Whereas we maintain that the whole complex ecosystem of the entire tumor, and that is very important to determine whether um, a patient will respond successfully or not based on the information by taking the whole context of the whole tumor. Thank you. Let me welcome Dr. Jack Steele to ask Andrew a second question. Andrew, very nice presentation, as Sue said. Talking about the context of the tumor, so is the Alton process applicable also for distributed tumors like leukemias? or is it uh, mostly for solid tumors? Thanks for that question. Yes, this is actually currently one of our main focus um, that we're trying to do with Alton is that we want to expand its application to, for example, leukemia. At the moment, we are currently investigating new gel formulations with one of our industry collaborators so that we can also test with leukemia. But not only that, we actually want to expand to other types of diseases, not just cancer. So we aim to actually expand the versatility and application of Alton with collaborations. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew, Sue and Jack. Wow, we're already halfway through. So let me please welcome our sixth presenter, Sally Richmond from the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health, Monash University. Children thrive when parents have the support they need, and that's never been as important as it is right now in the middle of this pandemic. But what happens when parents can't get that support? We know that parents play a crucial role in their child's development, especially their emotional development and their mental health. Unfortunately, where children are involved, things don't always go to plan, and parents often have concerns around behaviour and development. The real problem is though, that when parents go to seek support for these concerns, they can't always get it. Across Australia, one in three calls from parents to telephone counselling services go unanswered. In rural and regional areas, services are limited. In the private healthcare system, treatment can be very expensive. And in the public healthcare system, there are very long waiting lines. At the more severe end of this problem, we have one in seven Australian children with a mental health disorder. And the majority of these children don't get professional help, leaving parents unsupported and placing children at risk for a range of future challenges. So what's our big idea? 
We're using artificial intelligence to break down the wall between families and mental health support. More specifically, we're using voice technology to teach parents an effective, evidence-based communication strategy to build their child's emotional development. Voice technology is based on artificial intelligence, which we can think of as a computational system that performs processes that are similar to that of what a human would do. Natural language processing is the arm of artificial intelligence that focuses on how machines and computers understand what we say. Now, the science behind it is complicated, no doubt, but for parents, it translates into a simple, low-cost personal parenting coach that they can access at any time and anywhere. Using voice technology in this way is novel. It provides in-the-moment and real-time feedback, which books and online videos simply can't do. We have developed a prototype and we're currently evaluating it in a proof-of-concept study. We're looking for funding to further develop the prototype and we're investigating partnerships to explore financial viability. We are excited about the potential of this technology to support parents in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. We now welcome Dr. Jack Steele again to ask Sally a question. Sally, nice presentation, thank you. And the statistics you quote really are quite alarming, especially when you hear that for the first time. What can you tell us about whether or not, you know, what's the confidence that the algorithm delivers the same sort of parenting coach lessons as would an actual human coach? Yeah, that's a great question. That's kind of the million dollar question, I think. So we know that the parenting program we're implementing, emotion coaching is evidence-based and when it's developed, uh, delivered face-to-face, -face, it has documented uh, positive outcomes for children and their families. But the whole um, purpose of this research is to assess the feasibility and to see whether we can get those outcomes by delivering it through voice technology. And what we'd like to do is as we progress the research to assess it via a clinical trial or something of that nature. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Professor Michael Schutz to ask the second question for Sally. Thanks, Sally. While the topic of mental health is important, as you have outlined, likewise, the communication and the advice that someone is receiving must be built on a trustful relation. Now, how do you anticipate this can be established with an electronic device to be acceptable for the patient? Yeah, it's a great question. And in terms of assessing the feasibility of this approach, we are assessing the voice app as a, as a standalone app where parents will just download it and use it. And we're also assessing it as an app that sits along a parenting program. So when parents um, come along and attend six weeks and a clinician guides them through the voice app. And so by doing that, we'll be able to get a sense of whether parents are more likely to use the app when it's supported by a clinician, where there is that kind of relationship or whether it kind of stands alone. Thank you, Sally, Jack and Michael. Please welcome our seventh presenter, Dashen Dong from MIT University. Hello everyone, I'm Dashen Dong from MIT University. Today I want to show you how my research to help break the wall of age care monitoring. Aging is an issue that we all need to face at some point of our life. And do you know that we are already in an aged society? According to the United Nations World Population Prospects, by 2050, the number of the people aged over 65 will be doubled, which means one in six of us will have an age over 65. And by the end of this century, 155 countries will have more than 20% of the population with the age over 65. So caring for this large elderly population will be a great challenge for our society. And this will be even severe for the countries like Australia, that half of all women and a third of men will move into an aged care facility at some point of their lives. The limited availability of suitable trained professionals and nurses is one of the most pressing challenges 
facing for the aged care industry. There are also issues on non-personalized and insufficient service available in aged care. So to break this well, I develop a technology by utilizing the unbreakable soft electronics to fabricate a smart matrix cover. I use a scalable low-cost screen printing method to fabricate multiple sensors across the fabric, which then embedded into a bed cover. It can monitor several key biometric data, such as the body movement, breath rate, and heartbeat rate, and send those wirelessly to the cloud for data analysis. With this solution, supporting the elderly in an aged care facility become possible. By knowing the body movement, it could quickly alert nurses when unexpected falls happen during the night. It can, help, it can also help to support aged care workforces to improve their productivity and relatively reduce their workload. Furthermore, by analyzing the collected data, it can also help to detect the early symptoms of disease and give relative, relative advices to the clinician, which can help improve the life qualities of our elderly. Beyond that, this sensor system can also be used in each individual family with a monitoring need, which I believe can, can benefit the health and well-being our, of our whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Dashen. We will welcome back Kate Hart to ask Dashen a question. Thank you, and thanks, Dashen, for, for the presentation. Very interesting. Now, look, aged care has been a target uh, for medical devices seeking uh, to achieve more efficient monitoring for a number of years now, but there's been limited um, use. What do you think the major reason for this might be? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. I think yeah, uh, there has been a lot of trials has been put very hard to push this technique to further implant into the aged care monitoring uh, in, into the aged care facility. I guess the major concern will be sometimes uh, when people uh, for our elderly, they have some trust issue regarding the device to implant those uh, high-end technologies in their facility. So people intend to get a little bit uh, worry or concern about using the device. But I guess like uh, the event we are holding like this, we will tr just try to make uh, more people get a broad knowledge of such uh, te technical device can really help us to improve our life qualities and to, to really improve our uh, daily life. So yeah, that that's my, maybe the major uh, hurdle currently remaining. I think we, we just need to get more knowledge of the uh, current technology development. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I now welcome Rosie Hicks to ask a brief question. Dashan, thank you. Yes. Can you tell me uh, what's the manufacturing readiness level of this device? Uh, yes, uh, that's a very good question. Yes, so currently the project is supported by the Cooperate Research Center uh, project. So uh, we are actually working very close with, with our industry partners to scale up such technique to produce. Uh, has we, we currently have a couple of prototypes available now, and we are trying uh, to, to conduct some field trial in the uh, field course and try to uh, scale up this product. So in terms of the manufacturing, uh, because I use a scale up technology, uh, which is screen printing based method. So this can be easily achieved to, uh, for a scale up manufacturing. So yeah, that's a very good question. And when we did concern this, when we try to design such technique. Yeah. Thank you, Dashan. Yeah. Thank you, Dashan. Kate Thank and you. Rosie. Please welcome our eighth presenter, Ethan Chen from the University of Sydney. Hi, I'm Ethan Chen from the University of Sydney. In 2013, California, when engineers were getting to the last stage to commission the new span of the Bay Bridge connecting San Francisco and Oakland, a bad thing happened. When they were tightening this structure rod, many of them just fractured without any sign. After investigation, it is found that this is due to the hydrogen pickup during their anti-rust coatings. This phenomenon is known as hydrogen embrittlement, a physical term to describe the significant loss of metal toughness after hydrogen pickup. In this case, 
This hydrogen problem led to 45 US dollar loss for later in reinstallation and reinforcement. This case shows the power of hydrogen to disrupt our infrastructure. However, we still don't know exactly how hydrogen did this nowadays. On the other side of the world, Australia is now at the full speed to use hydrogen as a clean fuel. This national strategy is one of the most important initiatives for Australians to, to fight with climate change. However, our gas transportation infrastructure has not yet been compatible to hydrogen. To avoid the same loss as the US, we need to figure out the origin of this hydrogen problem sooner than later. I am a microscopy specialist. I use microscope to study material issues and solve them. I want to image the hydrogen within material so we can better understand how this embrittlement happens and find a solution against it. However, in our field, it is known that hydrogen imaging is extremely difficult. Normal microscopes typically don't have enough special resolution or sensitivity for hydrogen. Luckily, there is an exception, which is, which is atom probe tomography, which is able to provide 3D maps of atoms to study their distribution within materials. This technique is hydrogen sensitive and has a great atomic scale resolution. In a proof of concept measurement, I successfully found the clustering of, of hydrogen within material microstructure, which could indicate how hydrogen embrittlement begins at a fundamental scale. In this work, I actually used deuterium, a very rare hydrogen isotope, to represent our signal and get around the hydrogen background noise that exists everywhere, including the vacuum chamber of our microscope. After loading deuterium into our sample, I also used a cryogenic protocol to freeze our sample during handling, so our deuterium won't escape from the sample as fast as at room temperature. I believe my hydrogen imaging will lead to the radical understanding of hydrogen embrittlement as well as a tangible solution. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. We now welcome back Rosie Hicks to ask Ethan a question. Thank you, Ethan. You've, you've made some significant progress uh, in the lab there, but uh, are you in any discussions with industry to incorporate the results of your work and take this further? Yes, so thank you for your questions. Actually, this project is supported by an ARC linkage project. So we already have a partnership ready to industrialize that or to commercialize that. So that is something we already considered. Thank you. And now welcome Sue McLimmon to ask the second question. Uh, th thanks, Ethan. And look, this appears to be a methodology rather than a standalone solution. Um, what is the unique value proposition when you consider the broader competitive landscape? Right. So in terms of competitive landscape, um, in, in the methodology perspective, um, so we do have a competitor in Max, Max Planck Institute in Germany. But um, I would say that um, when we're dealing with the scientific questions, it really is not all about the instrument or technique or what approach you take. It's more about how fundamental you go into these questions and how, how, how deep your understanding is to deal with these questions to the right place. So um, I would rather say that from technical, technical perspective, that is what is happening right now. And from the industry perspective, I think um, because right now, all the steel makers, so primarily our application is in steels. So our steel makers are not that familiar with the property of hydrogen and how to deal with it. Because previously, there's just not that much need for transporting hydrogen. So now we see emergent need demand um, using hydrogen as a new form of renewable fuel, then we need to address that properly. Thank you, Ethan, Rosie and Sue. Now please welcome our ninth presenter, Pamela Bahorn from Deakin University. Movement is critical to interact with our physical and social world. Having movement problems can cause psychological disorders like depression and medical complications like obesity. But what about imagining movement? Well, motor imagery 
is when you imagine yourself performing an action without physically doing that movement. It seems important for planning and controlling movements, so having issues with motor imagery may contribute to movement disorders like developmental coordination disorder or DCD. DCD causes significant difficulties coordinating movement and impacts around 300,000 Australian children. Interestingly, people with DCD and other neurodevelopmental disorders affecting movement, like autism, also show difficulties imagining movement. Given it's cost-effective and easily accessible, using motor imagery in therapy may help improve movement. However, we don't really understand which parts of the brain are involved when using motor imagery, making it difficult to target during treatment. So my PhD is studying whether two parts of the brain important for movement are also involved in motor imagery in adults with and without DCD. These are called the primary motor cortex and the supplementary motor area. To do this, I've been using an advanced and innovative brain stimulation technique called theta burst stimulation. This novel device delivers continuous magnetic pulses over these areas and temporarily reduces brain activity. Unlike conventional stimulation methods, this needs less power to produce long-lasting and consistent changes in the brain, taking as little as 40 seconds. So my results show around 60 to 70% of individuals with and without DCD have worse motor imagery after reducing activity in the primary motor cortex and the supplementary motor area. This shows they may be important for motor imagery and that people who have difficulties imagining and conducting movement may have problems in the functioning of these brain areas. So what's the solution? Well, unlike my PhD, theta burst stimulation can also be applied to enhance brain activity. My idea is to apply this stimulation over these brain areas in people with DCD to try increase their motor imagery ability, which may hopefully improve motor functioning. While it's used for different conditions, this will be the first project to adopt this method to try treat movement difficulties through motor imagery. So this will not only inform motor imagery interventions, but it will test the effectiveness of using this innovative technique for targeting and reducing motor impairment. If successful, it may lead to the development of movement interventions using this cutting edge technology that will not only help people with DCD, but many other neurodevelopmental disorders affecting movement. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. We now welcome back Professor John Schein to ask Pamela a question. Thank you very much, Pamela. It's a, it's a fascinating area. Uh, but have there been any sort of, it, it may not be relevant or, or possible, but have there been any successful animal models where this approach has worked in any way? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so brain stimulation has certainly been trialled in, in animal models um, and explored, um, but in terms of movement, targeting movement through motor imagery, not that I'm aware of, no. However, it is currently, this, treat, this um, technique is currently approved for the treatment of depression, which works in sort of the same way where they try to increase activity in a certain part of the brain where they think is quite um, inactive and that's been sh shown to be quite successful and they're currently trialing it in um, people with autism as well for example so most of this is coming more from human models because we can see that it's quite effective but in terms of targeting this particular process and pathway we are going to be the first ones to do this thank you thank you thank you i now welcome back balbia blessy to ask pamela a second question Hi, Pamela. It's a very interesting uh, idea. Um, my question to you is, how sensitive is this method? And has this technique been used for exploration of other neural networks, for example, in the peripheral nerve systems? Yeah, thank you for your question. So um, this technique has certain, certainly been used to explore brain behaviour, particularly how the brain um, how the brain behaves in terms of many different cognitive and behavioral processes. So we tend, we've um, used many different types of this stimulation to answer many questions in both those areas and across the whole brain. Um, so not just movement. However, in terms of treating movement, um, as I said, it has been trialed in things like Tourette syndrome, dystonia, which involves muscle contractions. And again, it's been shown to be quite effective. Um, however, no one has targeted this particular system. And, Based on research, we believe that this system is 
closely connected to movement. So we're proposing that if we try to connect and target this system, we might have better results than simply targeting other areas in the brain. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Pamela, John and Balbier. Now, please welcome our final presenter, Emil McKenna from Queensland University of Technology. Imagine you're walking down the street and you get a pebble in your shoe. Now for most of us, this might hurt for just a second, but for diabetics, this can be a death sentence. Diabetic foot ulcers are an unappreciated yet major complication of diabetes. And these ulcers can and do result from something as simple as a pebble in your shoe. Up to 25% of diabetics will develop one of these ulcers. And in Australia, these result in more than 10,000 hospital admissions each year. Now treating these ulcers often requires amputation of the limb, but amputating the limb of someone who already can't heal properly is never gonna work. And unfortunately, 50 to 80% of these patients will die. Now what really transforms this pebble problem into a complete landslide is the fact that diabetes, the underlying cause, is the fastest growing chronic disease globally. And by 2045, there'll be more diabetics than the current population of Europe. Now couple this dramatically rising prevalence with the fact these ulcers constitute a third of the cost of diabetes. This is a global health epidemic rising like a mountain and the peak is getting higher. But finding a solution to this problem may be as simple as taking a lesson from the recent cancer therapies. Recent breakthroughs in cancer therapies have largely occurred due to a shift in focus from targeting the cancer cells themselves to instead physically rebuilding the patient's own immune cells to fight the cancer. These therapies are called cell and gene therapies and what they've been able to do is eliminate cancers. Cell and gene therapies are a powerful tool against disease because they rely on sophisticated cells, which means they can do things that no chemical alone can do. On top of that, we can actually alter these cells using gene modification, which means we can specifically tailor them to do exactly what we want. Cell and gene therapies were once a promising idea just out of reach. But now with new ropes and harnesses, our colleagues in cancer have made the leap because they have now demonstrated they're not only highly effective, but they're safe. So what does this mean for diabetic foot ulcers? Well, we know that these ulcers develop because the patient's wound healing cells have been damaged by disease. As a result, they do not produce sufficient amounts of the key wound healing molecules. I'm therefore using the same cell modification techniques behind these highly successful cancer therapies to rebuild these wound healing cells so that they produce these key wound healing factors. Climbing the rising diabetic foot ulcer mountain with a pebble in your shoe is near impossible. But through leveraging the breakthroughs behind these cancer treatments, we can simply swing from peak to peak using cell and gene therapies as the rope. Thank you, Eamon. Let me welcome Professor Michael Schutz to ask the first question to Eamon. Well, Eamon, I really like your pebble pitch. It was great. Now, from my own clinical experience, a challenge with diabetic patients who develop foot ulcers are frequently their compliance to follow treatment plans in the first instance. Now, are you already considering a subset of patients who you will target with your concept? Eamon? Are you muted, Eamon? Can you try again? Eamon? There we go. Uh, so yeah, sorry. So there are uh, subsets within the, the diabetic foot ulcer space that this treatment would be more appropriate for. Um, and that's also with diabetes in itself, where they're starting to think of it more as, as sort of like cancer. And in that diabetes is uh, a name for a group of diseases. And so there is a subset where this would be more appropriate for. And a key part of that, as you said, is patient compliance. And so what we're doing is also building a clinical team around us, uh, but also involving uh, mental health and nutritionists because 
what we want to do is for the patients where this is applicable, um, they're not moving now. Uh, they have a poor diet, but if we can correct the diet and overcome that mental component, they don't lose the limb because it's unlikely that they're going to become more active uh, after having their leg amputated. And through developing this therapy and addressing these other components, we give them the best chance to make a full recovery. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Eamon. And let me ask Professor John Schein to ask the second question. John, you're muted in the yeah, moment. Yeah, I, I got it. John's in the mute. <laughs> got me Thank too. you very much, Eamon. Um, great talk. Uh, but you, you make a lot of the analogy with cancer, but um, unlike most cancers, you really uh, only topical applications required for ulcers. Um, so how will the engineered cells, how will they compete with a lot of the, the current sort of topical biologics that are used, uh, wound healing and growth factors? Yep, that's a really good question. Um, so in diabetic patients, they have used a lot of topical therapies, but they have been largely uh, non-efficacious because the wound is a, it's got a, an outward fluid flow. Um, but also it's highly toxic to these molecules. So they get rapidly degraded. Also in these diabetic patients, a reason these wounds develop is because the underlying vasculature has actually already been damaged by diabetes. Therefore, through, through using this cell and gene therapy, we can inject this around the peripheral tissue of the wound site and hopefully rebuild that vasculature, which will then allow the patient's own cells to further penetrate into the wound site. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Michael and John. The presentation on yes, this breaking now the concludes wall of the force. presentations and the Q and A's. Welcome. Wasn't it a wonderful series of presentations and solutions for the future? The jury will now deliberate for twenty minutes. They have a tough job to do. We will be back soon to announce the top three winners who will have their pitch videos shared on Falling Wall's social media platforms. And potentially, they will be selected as one of the 10 finalists who will take part in the International Digital Falling Walls event on the 4th of November, and then will be awarded one presenter for the title of Breakthrough Winner of the Year in the Emerging Talents category on the final event on the 9th. Now, don't forget to cast your vote as the people choice. You will have until the jury returns to do so on Facebook and on YouTube, where the event is being live streamed. We will be back soon, but in the meantime, please enjoy hearing from some special guests. Thanks. Welcome, Reese. Welcome, Haley. Intense, that's how it was. Three minutes was short, shorter than you think it is. Three minutes, it's enough to say what's the purpose, what's the problem you want to solve, how you're gonna do it, and what does it take. What you're looking at right now is the first schematic for a cure for the deadliest infectious disease known to humanity. talk a lot so at different presentations I see myself running beyond time so the participation has helped me learn how to carve my story and then present it in a pitch form in a very short time. Thank you very much. I really fell in love with this event because it brings together all the great minds on one stage. You need to be also out of the box in order to share, to feed your own research with the contact with the others.
I hope that the future sees more collaborative efforts like this, where people come together, bring in different strengths, and fusing those together to solve complex problems. And science will be key to that um, journey. Two Australian scientists who know what it's like to present in Berlin will join me now. Rhys Peary won Falling Walls Lab last year with his presentation Breaking the Wall of Broken Glass. Dr. Hilly Teasdale took part the year before in Falling Walls with a presentation on Breaking the Wall of Falls. Welcome Rhys, welcome Haley. Rhys, tell us a little more about the subject of your talk. So my pitch was about a technique which we developed at the University of Queensland um, during my PhD there. And um, that was taking glass, which is too small to be sorted back into the right colour because you can only make uh, green glass from green glass or brown glass from brown glass. And so we're taking the small pieces of glass and extracting the silica out of them. And then that silica can be uh, used to make thousands of different consumer products like tyres, detergents, um, silica gel, and even toothpaste. And so that's what my pitch with the Fallen Walls was um, about. Haley, what was Breaking the Wall of Falls about? So I called my talk Breaking the Wall of Falls because I had developed a piece of technology that was a rehabilitation tool to help people um, who are at risk of um, falling, not to fall, to improve their balance. So it's basically a ball that you hold with two hands and as you move, you receive real-time feedback um, via vibration to the palm of your hand. And that was my idea for how to break the wall of falls. Hmm. Rhys, what did you find challenging or surprising about the whole experience in Berlin? I think the most difficult part of developing a pitch in terms of the whole competition is just being able to compress your research into three minutes, being really um, direct about what you're saying, capturing in enough detail, but also trying to integrate it into a story so that it's engaging for the audience and then when you move to Berlin it's um, it is very intimidating there's 100 of the kind of best and brightest people from around the world and there's a lot of imposter syndrome where you you get up and you you see other people's pictures and you're thinking is mine as good as theirs. So Hayley what lessons did you take away from Berlin? Uh, there was a lot <laughs> but I'd say my the biggest one to me was that you just have to think globally when you are heading to Berlin in the international final. Problems in Australia might be very different to problems around the world and you really have to make sure that you're framing your problem in a way that makes sense to everyone and you can show how your idea um, to break down a wall will impact everyone around the world. And I think that's really important to keep in mind if you are to be heading to Berlin soon. Um, one of the other things I was, I really took away from the whole experience was when I, before I went to Berlin, I was wondering why Berlin, why Germany? It's a truly international competition. Why is it happening in Germany? I think it's a really important thing to consider is that Germany is a huge hub for research and development and innovation. And it's such an opportunity to be able to engage with a lot of the local people from Germany who might see research and development in a totally different light. So to put that into context, the, the Germany spends nearly twice as much as Australia does as a percentage of GDP on research and innovation. It's how they invest in their future. And to engage with people who are living that every day is inspiring. So it's um, something really special. Mm. So we, we saw you winning the global event last year. 
What was it like and how did it impact you? Um, I guess the, the impact is on a, a few different levels. There's an immediate um, reaction, which is probably one of surprise. And then um, in the, the couple of days after, there's a lot of media coverage. And, and so I probably wasn't anticipating to win. So I wasn't anticipating um, for that to happen and uh, somewhat overwhelming. And you go, and when we went through the experience and the reception at the Naturkunde uh, Museum, was just incredible. I think it was a, um, a feeling of, I probably didn't appreciate uh, going into the, into the competition, how, how much of a, a big deal and how important um, this was going to be. And then on a longer timeline, once I came back to Australia, there was, again, a lot of um, engagements from the media and people who wanted to hear about uh, my research, which is Is, which is great, but really unexpected and not something that you you prepare for. And then I think for me personally, um, as I was coming towards the end of my PhD, um, it really helped my profile um, in looking for employment. Mm -hmm. And um, it was definitely something that helped me to stand out from other candidates. And I think it went a long way to um, help me secure my Uh, job that I'm in at the moment, which is with New South Wales government. Can I just add to that, as someone who had the absolute pleasure of watching Reese win on that falling wall stage last year, what an incredible moment, uh, a brilliant performance, funny, informative, but just a moment of national pride. People were congratulating me from, for being from Australia because <laughs> we brought him to Germany. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. So looking into the future, Haley, if you meet someone now who is interested in falling walls, we are just right in the middle of this uh, finale here in Australia. Uh, what would you tell them? Why should they enter and what could they do? I think there's a million and one reasons, but the biggest thing is you need to learn how to communicate your research effectively. Rhys touched on this earlier to be able to summarize why your research is important and why it's going to change the world. Almost an impossible task, but it's essential if you are going to communicate that to people in the future. And Falling Walls is a great way for you to learn how to do that effectively. Um, beyond that, it gives you that reality check. Where am I at in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of all the ideas that are happening around the world? You're meeting 100 brilliant young innovators who you can collaborate with and learn from and um, stay in touch with as the years go on. And so you join this brilliant alumni network. So it's so much more than just presenting your idea in three minutes on a stage. It is really setting you up for the future. Well, thank you for your conveying your experience, for telling us what it was like. And we'll have new people going to Berlin, at least virtually very soon. So thank you, Rhys. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Hans, and um, best of luck to everyone who's uh, presenting today. I'm sure you've done a fantastic job and excited to hear about the results. It's this incredible connection of people and I find myself just going, wow. It's about what science can do and what society can become. What was science fiction has now become science. Falling walls, what a great image. These robots are human-made system, and so we're going to need to work together. In future, we can do better, and we must. Science always build bridges, and uh, I'm very proud to be part of it. It's a unique event of that kind. Speakers that take us to the edge of our understanding. Bang. Great. So trying to think that this was the beginning of time makes no sense at all. I'm going to show you the audience tonight. Will you help me shine a light on this incredibly urgent issue? This conference is all about getting walls to break down so that we don't damage humanity. The fundamental question is, are we alone? Breaking the wall means opening new windows and discovering the unexpected that can be fantastic. 
Yeah, wow, isn't that wow? The signal of two black holes coalescing. This is what it sounds like. Through your commitment and your effort, you will create a better future. It's time to act. It's urgent. Do it now. I have not seen anything else like that worldwide. I really enjoy putting my ideas into uh, relation to what's possible in terms of innovation. It's such a great opportunity for innovators to share ideas with people who can actually make them happen. We can design a Spider-Man suit. It's not really possible. This is a rapid fire boot camp for young scientists from the entire world. Falling Walls Venture shows that the excellence of basic research can turn into proud entrepreneurial solutions. A rich diversity of science communicators across the world doing amazing things. Falling Walls has pulled together an international group of luminaries. For me, is really a dream come true. community that cares. Here I get the new perspectives. That was really inspiring. Brilliant researchers. It's such an incredible atmosphere. I've been learning a lot of interesting things. Overall I think it's a huge message of hope that you, you get. There are walls everywhere. Let's bring them down. Why doesn't everyone accept that climate change is real? And why do some educated people choose not to vaccinate their children? Facts just don't seem to be enough on their own anymore. At the Australian Academy of Science, we realised it wasn't enough just to publish science papers to have impact. Here, would you like to read this? We have to change the way people engage with science by starting a conversation where they spend hours every day, social media. Together with the Academy's fellows, that's the best in science, along with science communicators and mainstream media professionals, we found a way to create credible clickbait. What surprised us most were the results. Our Facebook page started with 9,000 followers and grew to over 1 million within a year. Today we have 1.5 million followers. And the engagement was meaningful. Our audience was telling us they got their children vaccinated after watching our videos and they started having constructive debates about climate change and other issues. At the Australian Academy of Science, my team and I have found a formula that works to engage the public in science. But making content that counts isn't as simple as posting any video or article online and hoping for the best. There's a specific digital grammar that cuts through and it's different for each social media platform. We've developed a unique review process to make sure that the content isn't only engaging, it's also accurate. We've taken scientific excellence and complemented it with excellence in engagement. Our global audience is growing and we want to partner with more science organisations around the world to share the success. Curious? The Falling Walls Lab competition is just one part of a much bigger conference that runs each year in Berlin. Falling Walls Engage is aimed at showcasing the world's best science communication projects. Last year, the Director of Communication of and Outreach for the Australian Academy of Science, Paul Richards, attended as a member of the jury. Welcome, Paul. Good to be here, Hans. 
What was the experience like? The experience was incredible. I have never attended anything like it. You've got the best science communication projects from around the world uh, attending this event, showcasing all sorts of different projects from video production to podcasts to educational resources. And really a bit like today's uh, competition, uh, the presenters each had three minutes to talk about their particular project and how it was changing uh, the way that we can communicate science. And you would like to bring Engage to Australia? How are you doing that? Well, we'd really love to uh, replicate what we're doing here today with Falling Walls Lab and do it for Engage and bring together Australia and the region's best science communicators and have workshops, uh, learn from each other and perhaps uh, in the future hold a competition like today's to showcase some of the best uh, science communication projects and then ultimately uh, send some people to Berlin to um, participate in the conference there. Oh, great. Thanks, Paul. Science at the Shine Dome celebrates excellence in Australian science. Australian scientists have made major contributions. It's also the top networking event for researchers from all disciplines and career levels to meet the country's most influential scientists. We have lots of early and mid-career researchers come to Science at the Shine Dome. They can develop networks, they can develop mentorship with some of the leading scientists. There are workshops, presentations and a gala dinner featuring political and industry leaders. More than 400 people attend from all over the world. I've had four amazing space flight experiences. And around 500,000 people are engaged on social media. Science at the Shine Dome is a unique Australian science event and networking opportunity. change the world in three minutes. Three young Australian researchers will try to do just that at the Falling Walls Lab finale in Berlin, an international forum for the next generation of outstanding thinkers and innovators. They will each present a three minute pitch alongside 100 other finalists from more than 55 labs across the globe. It's very exciting, it's an amazing opportunity. I will be able to talk to different people, so potentially there might be a company that's interested in uh, commercialising the platform. Dr. Eleanor schneider fuschik has developed a platform that measures drug concentrations in cystic fibrosis patients to evaluate and predict patient outcomes. So patients currently only have life expectancies of about 40 years, which is not good enough just yet. So we still need to work on giving them longer life expectancies and helping them live better lives. Kate Seacom is investigating the gut microbiome's role in personalising cancer treatments to prevent intestinal toxicity, which can have a debilitating effect on a patient's quality of life. Being able to predict gut toxicity from a range of cancer treatments is um, going to save money, it's going to save people's embarrassment, save pain, just really be able to increase people's quality of life during cancer treatment. Rhys Piri has developed a chemical recycling process to take waste glass, which is currently going to landfill, and turn it into everyday products like fertilisers, detergents, and even toothpaste. One of the things I like to say is we don't have a waste problem, we have a lack of incentive to recycle. So if we can increase the value of the waste products that we're trying to recycle, then it provides that incentive to actually use it in useful products. From the side effects of medical treatments to a global waste problem, which of these walls will fall next? The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions moment in our battle need with the coronavirus. With many in Africa being of particular concern. Scientists in Oxford are hoping to have a million doses of a coronavirus vaccine. Science has never been more crucial. Around the world, people are scared. They want to know what to do and where to turn for advice. But that advice has to come from the right sources. Hi, I'm Nula Hafner, and my job is to introduce you to the world's best scientists. We're talking very big thinkers with some very big ideas about our future. With science, you're trying to uncover something no one else has ever managed to discover. Global Science is a new fortnightly web show produced by the International Science Council 
in partnership with the Australian Academy of Science. So the vision of the International Science Council is of science as a global public good. And the ISC represents natural and social science academies, scientific unions, associations and research councils right across the globe. Meaning you and I get access to the who's who of science. Global Science with Nula Hafner, appearing soon in your social feed. Science matters to all of us. We're living in science. We're a world that's driven by science. A world without science would be a desolate sort of place. No technology, no electricity, no travel, no planes, no medicine. A good scientist is someone who can ask a really good question. Once you've answered it, it will have an impact on all sorts of other fields. With science, you're trying to uncover something no one else has ever managed to discover. I think the moment of discovery is a really interesting moment. The point where you realise that you're studying something that could be profoundly interesting and you can almost taste the discovery. It's the biggest buzz you can imagine. The aha moment. It's like, oh my God, we've got it. We live in a world of extraordinary challenges. The solutions to those challenges are more science and technology, not less. If the public have a deeper understanding of science, that allows them to make more informed choices about the way they live their lives, the way they interact with the planet and being healthier, which ultimately impacts their families and their communities. The future doesn't happen to us, we get to decide. Those decisions will be about how we best use technology and science to solve the very many problems that are facing us. We have come a really long way in scientific discovery and innovation over the last 100 years, even in the last decade. But there is still so much that we don't know. The beauty of the universe. Understanding the basic building blocks of life. The beauty of how things work. With science, you can solve problems. With science, you can make discoveries that none of us could ever have imagined. Meet some of Australia's top young physicists. Samuel Hinton, for example, is researching dark matter. And I'm trying to now also use gravitational waves, the next big thing in astrophysics or Dr. Sarah Walden, who studies non-linear optics. The big application we're trying to work towards is electronic circuits, so making these structures conductive so we can have the smallest, lightest and thereby fastest electronic circuits in the world. And this is Fiona Panther from the field of microphysical astronomy. That's looking at how processes which occur on really tiny scales actually affect the universe on much larger scales. They're among 13 physicists, including eight women, representing Australia at the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting in Germany. Along with other young scientists from around the world, they'll be rubbing shoulders with 42 Nobel Prize winners. I'm quite excited to see the real side of the Nobel Laureate stories, the struggles they went through, the years where no one believed their ideas and they just had to persist regardless. The researchers were nominated by the Australian Academy of Science and their travel is funded by the Science and Industry Endowment Fund. You have around 600 early career researchers who are kind of the same stage of their career as I am, but also these 50 Nobel laureates who have really climbed to the very pinnacle of what we think of in terms of achievement in physics. A unique collaboration serving as an investment in the future of science. Can you explain your big idea in three minutes? We take a product which is costing money and turn it into one that's worth more than $1,000 a tonne. The Falling Walls Lab is back. We're looking for 10 presenters to make their pitch during an all-new virtual format in September. Even though we maybe can't meet in person, there's still lots of ways that we can collaborate. You'll be competing for a place in the Falling Walls Remote 2020 finale. 
If nothing else, it's an opportunity to think about how you communicate your research. The biggest win was there was a respiratory physician in the audience who came and talked to me afterwards and they are actually now recruiting patients and collecting samples for me. Falling Balls 2020. Great exposure for your research. Do it. Find out more by visiting our website science.org.au slash falling walls. Will you help me shine a light on this incredibly urgent issue? Yeah, wow, isn't that wow? Science matters to all of us. We're living in science. We're a world that's driven by science. A world without science would be a desolate sort of place. No technology, no electricity, no travel, no planes, no medicine. A good scientist is someone who can ask a really good question. Once you've answered it, it will have an impact on all sorts of other fields. With science, you're trying to uncover something no one else has ever managed to discover. I think the moment of discovery is a really interesting moment. The point where you realise that you're studying something that could be profoundly interesting and you can almost taste the discovery. It's the biggest buzz you can imagine, the aha moment, it's like, oh my god, we've got it. We live in a world of extraordinary challenges. The solutions to those challenges are more science and technology, not less. If the public have a deeper understanding of science, that allows them to make more informed choices about the way they live their lives, the way they interact with the planet and being healthier, which ultimately impacts their families and their communities. The future doesn't happen to us, we get to decide. Those decisions will be about how we best use technology and science to solve the very many problems that are facing us. We have come a really long way in scientific discovery and innovation over the last 100 years, even in the last decade. But there is still so much that we don't know the beauty of the universe. Understanding the basic building blocks of life. The beauty of how things work. With science you can solve problems. With science you can make discoveries that none of us could ever have imagined. We tend to think of glass as a good guy of the packaging world. That's why we use it for the important things like beer and luxury water. Kudos to the organisers for organising the prop. And there's a good reason for this. I mean, sure, it takes a lot of energy to make it in the first place, but once it's made, it's, in theory, infinitely recyclable and, compared to plastics, relatively non-polluting. But there's a big problem with glass, or more specifically, there's a big problem with little pieces of glass in the glass supply chain. Because when you smash a bottle and it breaks into pieces that you can't sort into the right colour, we can only make green glass from green glass or brown glass from brown glass. And so when the pieces are too small, it can't be made into glass anymore. That destroys its value and it's not reused. And that's why more than half of all glass is not recycled. That's more than 60 million tonnes a year, enough to build a wall roughly a metre high, a metre wide and 40,000 kilometres long all the way around the equator. So what's the big idea? Well, when you look at the supply chain of glass, we've got the raw materials, energy goes in, it's made into a bottle, it's either recycled or not. It's very similar to this chemical, sodium silicate. Sodium silicate is one of the most widely used industrial chemicals in the world. We consume about 10 million tonnes of it a year and the global market's worth about $10 billion. It's used to make thousands of products, everything from tyres to detergents, silica gel and even toothpaste. And you probably see where this is going. During my PhD, I've developed a process to take glass, digest it in alkaline solution, and separate it out into sodium silicate and a solid intermediate from which we can extract silica gel. 
And through 4,000 hours of optimization tests, which is about as fun as watching paint dry, I've actually managed to define the parameters where this can proceed in an economically um, viable way. And we've filed a patent to protect those and are going through the commercialization process. And that's what's exciting for me, because when we have glass that's currently going to landfill and we convert it into high purity silica, we take a product which is costing money and turn it into one that's worth more than $1,000 a tonne. And because we use the energy and raw materials which went into making glass in the first place, we can actually make sodium silicate at 50% of the cost of the conventional production route. Thank you. Welcome we back to, to our audience, our presenters and jury. tend to think of glass as a good guy packaging jury. well. That's why we use the it for the important building. things like beer. But and before we move on and announce the winner, we have a special presentation from our event partner, you are sex. Please welcome Nishant Chandelier, regional representative of Eurosex Australia and New Zealand. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, many congratulations to all the finalists of the competition and to all the candidates who have submitted their applications. It seems to me that they're already winners because they have accepted the challenge of presenting their research in an accessible way and in such telling times. It is critical that people know what is done in the labs and how brilliant minds like you work to tear down the walls. Society has much to learn and benefit from your efforts. I am Nishant Sandilia, the regional representative for Euraxis Australia and New Zealand. Euraxis is an initiative of the European Commission that addresses barriers to the mobility of researchers and seeks to enhance scientific collaboration between Europe and the rest of the world. We provide free information about European research, career opportunities, international collaboration, and networking possibilities. To simplify what Euraxis does, we need to understand that there are four pillars to it, which is pertinent for researchers. Pillar one is jobs and funding. You can take advantage of Euraxis portal and find your job in research. We list thousands of vacancies and fellowships from more than 40 European countries and other regions in the world. Alternatively, if you are an institution and are looking to find talented and experienced staff, you can do that as well. Currently, there are 9,393 research positions available on our portal. Within this pillar, you can find a wealth of information on research funding throughout Europe, from individual grants to supporting startups. Alternatively, you might be a grant beneficiary and need a host organization. Currently, there are 138 funding opportunities available. Moving on to pillar two, which is information and assistance. This will be useful if you plan to work or leave a European country. Euraxis has more than 40 national portals with country-specific information packed with practical advice on all matters concerning your professional and daily life, as well as career development opportunities. Also, you can save time and energy by using more than 600 Euraxis support centers, helping researchers free of charge with a wide range of services facilitating your move and stay abroad. Pillar three is partnering. This is helpful to those who have already got funding and are looking for a host organization. Or maybe you need a bright mind to launch your startup. Your access matches talented supply and demand. There are currently 93,548 registered members and 17,766 registered organizations and universities from across the globe. Last but not the least, Pillar 4 is Euraxis Worldwide. It is the international arm of Euraxis. It offers you the chance to interact on a global scale and is a networking tool supporting researchers who wish to connect or stay connected with Europe. Euraxis Worldwide has eight global hubs in North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, China, India, Japan, Korea, ASEAN, and Australia and New Zealand. Euraxis Australia and New Zealand is the most nascent hub, which started operations in January 2020, with the objective to link researchers from both these countries with Europe. As mentioned earlier, we provide free information about European research, career opportunities, international collaboration, and networking possibilities. Since all of you are watching this on your laptop or phone, I'll encourage you to type Euraxis Australia and New Zealand on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook and follow us there. We try to bring 
relevant news and events on a timely and regular basis. We're very happy to partner with the Australian Academy of Science and the Embassy of Germany in Canberra for the Falling Walls Lab Australia, as this complements what we are trying to do, that is, reducing barriers. It would have been logical for Euraxis to offer today's winners a trip to Europe to visit a laboratory of their choice, as we could have done in other parts of the world in the past with Falling Walls Lab. But with the current COVID-induced circumstance, we are glad to invite them to do a virtual course in scientific communication with European trainers, which will help them to prepare their video for the international contest. Last but not the least, to all those who are watching us, if you are interested in doing a doctorate or postdoctorate in Europe, or if you want to work on projects in collaboration with European researchers and innovators, get in touch with Euraxis Australia and New Zealand and let us help you. Good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nishant. It is wonderful to have your access as a partner, and we're looking forward to continuing this relationship into the future. Now, a message from Dolata Ellen Finkel, Chief Scientist of Australia. Greetings, Falling Walls contenders. I am deeply sorry that I'm not able to be part of the Falling Walls Lab today. I've chaired the jury for the Australian event for the last four years in a row, and I have been overwhelmingly impressed every time. Not being here this year to hear the innovative ideas on which walls will fall is my loss. The reason for my absence is that I'm currently immersed in matters related to COVID-19 and how we can find solutions and recover from this pandemic. I encourage each of you presenting today to continue your careers in science and pursue strong collaborations in Australia and internationally to deliver innovative solutions that address shared global challenges, such as the current pandemic. I wish you all the best of luck, and I look forward to learning about the winners and your incredible projects. May the force be with you. Some wonderful words from our chief scientists. Before we get into announcing the winners, let us quickly recap our 10 presenters. Joshua Pate from the University of Technology, Sydney. Ethan Chen from the University of Sydney, Pamela Bahur from Deakin University, Eamon McKenna from the University of Technology, thank you and congratulations to you all. Do we have some technical issue, Paul, or are we... Okay, so before I hand over to John, can you, before I hand over to John for the announcement of the winners, I would like to announce the People's Choice winner according to the votes of social media. And the people's choice is Dashen Dong. Congratulations, Dashen. I invite you to say a few words. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for the people's choice award. I feel so humbled to receive this award. Yeah, and also, thank you for the. Dashen. And thank you, thank you for the sponsors for, the uh, for yeah, such for great events. events. And we really and hope that we will continue to have such amazing events in the coming, the coming years, years to, to get more uh, communication uh, of our science achievements. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dashen. Now, please welcome Julie Chair and President of the Australian Academy of Science, Professor John Stein. Thank you very much, Hans. Um, I think someone's got their microphone open and I'm hearing all this radio shuffling or something. But thank you very much. And on behalf of all the jury, I'd like to congratulate all the presenters on a truly an outstanding job. They're all, they were all very interesting areas, very different areas. As, as Alan Finkel said a moment ago, it was really inspiring to, to listen and to see those presentations. And I'm sure that, uh, as we've already heard, every one of the 10 that is here today presenting is already a winner. I mean, they were just outstanding. And I think Australia is very proud and we'd be very proud of any one of those 10 going to represent us at the International Falling Walls Lab. Um, however, at, at the end of the day, we have to uh, we have to pick three. Um, so it was, as I say, it was very difficult. We agonised a lot over it. But at the end of the day, the jury has made a decision. And it's a great pleasure to to announce those uh, those three winners. The third place is awarded to Andrew Law for is making it? cancer treatments much more effective. Andrew, congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? Hi, everyone. Thanks for the award. That's really great. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, right now, that, uh, that's awesome. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisors, especially, and they were really helpful in, um, you know, always supporting me. And I'd like to thank all the judges and everyone here for setting such an amazing event, the Falling Walls Lab. Um, the Falling Walls Lab. Yeah, it's true, truly an honor to receive this award. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Could everybody else just doubly check that they've got their microphone uh, turned off so we get into that background noise? Anyway, congratulations again, Andrew. Fantastic job. Uh, great hope for um, especially us more mature individuals who are much more likely to face the challenge of cancer. Uh, we want to make sure those treatments are effective as possible. And it's a great pleasure now to award second place awarded to Alan Robertson for the Genetics of Doctors. Alan, would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much, everyone. Um, very, very unexpected. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my team, uh, who are part of Queer Sky Genomics. I'd like to thank uh, the team from Agenda Ventures, Ventures and everyone else who supported me through this process. So UQ Ventures, Bridge Tech, uh, the ON program, LSQ Catalyst. It's just been such an amazing opportunity. So thank you all very much for the opportunity. Thank you all very much. And thank you again, Alan. And now the the winner has judged uh, by the jury, and as I said, it was a very difficult jury exercise, but uh, at the end of the day, the number one went to Jessica Hamilton for research in carbon dioxide in mining. Jessica, your turn to say a few words. Um, thank you to all the organizers of the Falling Walls and all the other contestants. I think this has just been a really exciting event to be part of. Um, I'd just like to thank my boss, Peter, for encouraging me to apply and my colleagues for uh, their feedback. Um, and most importantly, my supervisors, such as my friends, for being able to produce this footage um, yeah, and for me to do the science. Okay, thank you very much, Jessica, and congratulations again. And again, just to finally, um, I'd like to thank all the jury members uh, and all the participants and all the audience, and congratulations in particular to all of our, our winners. So thank you very much. Back to you, Hans. Thank you, John. And apologies to everybody for the technical difficulties. We seem to have some feedback here and haven't traced it quickly enough. Now, congratulations to all our presenters.
and to our winners. I would also like to thank the jury members, Professor John Schein, Balbir Blessy, Kate Hart, Rosie Hicks, Sue McLehman, Professor Michael Schütz, Dr. Jack Steele. I would also like to thank the event partners and donors, both locally, globally, who make Falling Walls Lab possible. We would like to encourage everyone to take part in the Berlin events this year, because we can all be there. No flights to Berlin required this year. The Academy will share the details with those who have registered to today's event. And in this way, you can listen in via social media and various channels which we'll announce. So we have Team Australia and we hope that you will tune in in November. This now concludes Falling Walls Lab Finale Australia 2020. I'm Professor Hans Bachor. Good afternoon. And thank you, Hans and Nancy Pritchard and all the team. Here.